this is a story about intelligence work, which is a soothing, respectable name for spying. Military intelligence is as old as warfare itself. What every commander has always wanted to know was what's going on behind the hill. What is the enemy up to? Is he going to attack? And if so, with what? There are various ways of finding out. You can put spies in the enemy's camp. You can look down on him from balloons and aeroplanes and nowadays from satellites. But ever since the invention of wireless, it's been much more profitable to listen in to him than to watch him. The British were the first to discover this, and that story begins here on the top of the cliffs at Hunston in Norfolk. British intelligence began picking up German military messages in a fairly haphazard way very early on, and they were soon deciphering them in room 40 in Whitehall. It soon became apparent, however, that they were missing out on a lot of important stuff, and the discovery was made, curiously enough, by a couple of amateurs. Russell Clark of Abergavenny was a radio enthusiast. His amateur call sign was THX. Over in Bath was another amateur radio man called R.J.B. Hipsley, whose call sign was HLX. Both of these men found they had something in common. They were both receiving a large number of German naval messages on their homemade receivers. Realising the importance of this, they went to the Admiralty and persuaded them to set up a listening or intercept station here on the cliffs of Hunston. It's a pretty obvious place when you come to think of it, as there wasn't much but the North Sea, the German Ocean they used to call it, between us and Germany. What was remarkable was that the two amateurs were able to persuade the GPO and the Admiralty that they were able to listen into the Germans better than the professionals could. Anyway, Hipsley was rapidly made a commander in the Royal Naval Reserve and given a free hand to select and organize and build a string of wireless stations to listen in to what the Germans were saying to their submarines, their surface vessels, uh, and their zeppelins. You can tell how important the authorities thought this enterprise was because he was given virtually a blank check and all the materials and staff he wanted to get on with it. Although all this work was highly secret, there was a great deal more leisure in those days and Hipsley was able to bring his wife up to Hunston to sample the sea air and enjoy the social life of the area. The whole of this complex is now called the Hipsley Hut, but actually it's that bit over there which is the original Hipsley Hut, and that's where they worked. Later on, when the station expanded, they were joined by a very mysterious figure. He remained mysterious even when he wasn't up to this sort of thing. And his name was Leslie Harrison Lambert, call sign G2ST. But years later, he became much better known under the name of Alan one of the BBC's most celebrated storytellers of the 20s and 30s, A.J. Allen. It was really very much of an in-group because not only were they both radio amateurs, but both of them, both Hipsley and A.J. Allen, as it became later, had both been to the same public school, to rugby, as a matter of fact. And those, that was in the days when we hadn't seen through the old called Tide Network. We'd not heard of Philby or Burgess and McLean, and it was considered an almost infallible method of finding a man you could trust. Protecting the wireless stations was HMS Cricket, a gunboat which occasionally loosed off a few rounds from its anti-aircraft gun, much to the discomfort of the local inhabitants. But the only chance they ever had of shooting down a Zeppelin, the crew were ashore at a civic reception. The staff at the station at Hunston soon grew large enough to support a football team and quite a few reserves, but it was the game with the Germans, the great game of intelligence that the Navy was here to play, and in this they were winning every match. This was due to the adoption of new tactics and new equipment. This direction-finding wireless set made it possible to pinpoint enemy transmissions. It was the result of development work by H.J. Round of the Marconi Company and used what were called soft sea valves. This made the equipment much more sensitive than the German sets and allowed us to listen into their warships while they were actually lying in their home waters. The German Navy made no attempt to conceal this traffic, supremely confident that they could not be heard. In fact, on May the 30th, 1916, the direction finding stations reported that German warships at Wilhelmshaven, 300 miles away, were making an unusual amount of wireless traffic. Later that afternoon, it was reported that the warships had left Wilhelmshaven and were now lying in the River Yade, some seven miles away. 
This movement was shown by a change in bearing of the wireless signals of less than one and a half degrees. A remarkable achievement for those days. On receiving this information, the Admiralty guessed that the German fleet was about to put to sea. And they were able to order the British fleet to sail immediately and make for the German Bight. Early next day, one of the most decisive naval battles in history was fought, the Battle of Jutland. The actual score in ships lost in that battle was definitely in favour of the Germans, but the result was that it put pay to the German fleet. It never sailed in force again. That is a known fact of history. What has not been known until now is the vital part played in the battle by naval intelligence. By spying on the German wireless signals, stations like Hunston enabled British ships to sail four and a half hours before the German warships had even left the mouth of the River Yarder. Without that advantage, what might have happened? Well, there's certainly the distinct possibility that the German fleet might have reached the high seas to wreak havoc among the Allied shipping. Our own losses in the battle would have been even greater, and there's just the possibility that the battle might have been lost. For his work on the wireless stations, Commander Hipsley was awarded the OBE. More significant was a line in his Times obituary years later when he was described as one of the men who really won the war. Between the wars, wireless, or radio as it became known, made rapid advances technically, and it was obvious that it would play a major part in the new conflict which was rapidly approaching. Our security service, MI5, was particularly worried about the possibility of German agents in this country, not only sending messages, but also guiding Luftwaffe bombers to their targets along radio beams. Of course, our armed forces had their own radio listeners. They were called the Y services, but they just didn't have the men to cope. It's at this point that Richard Gambier Parry comes into the picture. He was himself a radio amateur, and he was in charge of the special communications units of the Royal Signals. It was decided that unit number three, radio security services, should tackle the job. But where were all these badly needed Morse code experts to be found? Who was going to find them? They came up with the right man for the right job in Arthur Watts. He'd come out of the Dardanelles minus a leg and joined naval intelligence as soon as he could walk again. He was a man who could be trusted and he was also the president of the Radio Society of Great Britain. I was asked to go down and see Lord Sandhurst. He said to me, we want to get chaps listening out for enemy signals. Now, do you think, and we want heaps of amateurs doing this work, do you think you can help? I said, yes, I, I feel sure I could, and I felt that it was a golden opportunity to be able to show that the amateurs were an asset to the country. And so everybody, of course, had to be vetted. And so I started off and I went, first of all, to my one or two who I was closely allied with uh, on the council, Doug Charman, Eddie Gay and others. And from then I went all over the country seeing the people I knew. And that is how we started the thing off. The scene now shifts to the unlikely location of His Majesty's prison at Wormwood Scrubs. Inside this undoubtedly secure establishment, Major Lord Sandhurst of MI5 had an office. And he was put in charge of these specially vetted amateurs and other Morse experts who were to be called voluntary interceptors or VIs. One radio amateur who was asked to help was the former medical officer of health for Lowestoft, Dr Arthur G. As far as I was concerned, it began by a uh, chap coming to see me one day and um, he was in civilian clothes but I formed the opinion that he was probably from the Navy and um, he uh, outlined the scheme to me uh, saying that um, if I could help uh, he'd be very pleased for me to do so and um, after he'd outlined the scheme I thought well uh, you know here goes it's certainly a good idea but um, if we do get invaded I've more or less signed my death warrant no doubt but um, Anyway, we signed on the dotted line and uh, 
started off and it was very very interesting because we had to listen to certain frequencies on the radio that we were given and copy down the sort of code that we heard. I was always very intrigued to know just exactly what these signals were and uh, who was listening to them and uh, who we were listening to and uh, what they all meant and um, so on and so forth. And I must say that even to this very day I, I, I'm not really quite sure exactly what we were listening to and what it all meant. Well, as you can see, security was extremely tight and possible VIs were investigated thoroughly. Sometimes police were used to make a cautious initial approach. That was the way it happened to Hugo Lawley, who now lives at Caister. He was approached by the local inspector. He said, would you be prepared to do some work for um, His Majesty's government? So naturally I said, well, what sort of work do you want me to do, inspector? He said, well, he said, I believe they want you to do some radio work. And you being a radio amateur, they thought you might fit the bill. Well, naturally, I was a little bit apprehensive, but nevertheless, I thought, well, it must be important. So I agreed. And whereupon the official secret act was read over to me. Then I received what I would call my first briefing. About a week later, I received a confidential communication um, from a mysterious box number in Hertfordshire. And uh, this communication requested that um, I carried out uh, certain periods of watchkeeping on the uh, radio frequency spectrum and specifically pay a attention to any repetitive uh, uh, signals that were being transmitted from any source whatsoever. Anyway, uh, this information I forwarded to, to my headquarters. I got a, a, an acknowledgement to the effect uh, that this was watch please, uh, very good, um, observe, and uh, I, I got a certain amount of satisfaction to, to think that I, I was providing something. This is the rather primitive radio set used by those secret listeners as they worked in the garden, sheds and back rooms. What was remarkable was how a group of scattered volunteers managed to maintain such good security. Only once was the cat nearly let out of the bag when the Daily Mirror came out with this story on February the 14th, 1941. I imagine this must have been jumped on from a great height, for nothing else seems to have ever appeared and the Germans don't seem to have spotted it. The voluntary interceptors were soon spread throughout the country. Arranged in small groups centred on towns, each with its own group leader, individual VIs often knew no one else in the whole system apart from his own group leader. All group leaders were put under a regional office. An inconspicuous building like this one in Cambridge, now a gent's hairdresser's shop. In each office was a captain in the Royal Signals with a secretary. At least once a day he was in touch with Box 25, Barnet, by a scrambled telephone call. Any VI who listened for 48 hours a month was exempted from such duties as fire watching and the home guard. Some operators did more than 160 hours. Now I have to tell you something that will surprise you. With all this listening, the voluntary interceptors found very few German spies. The fact is that there were very few to find, and the enemy agents there were about were rapidly rounded up. I played a part in the rounding up of one myself, as a matter of fact. Several spies were shot and others turned into double agents by Professor Masterman and his famous Double Cross Committee. So, was the whole VI enterprise a bit of a failure? No, very far from it for our amateur secret listeners had stumbled onto something infinitely more important. What they were hearing were strange messages using five-figure codes and a system of changing call signs. It soon became obvious that the enemy was using amateur radio-style operating techniques in an attempt to avoid detection. All this traffic was sent by the VIs to a post office box number, Box 25, Barnet, Hertfordshire. Box 25, we could now reveal, was a large country house called Arkley View. It was there at the headquarters of the Voluntary Interceptors Network that Lord Sandhurst and his specialists began to sift through the logs that were soon flooding in. The next big development was the opening in 1941 of a complete interceptor listening station at Hanslope Park, now the home of a Foreign and Commonwealth Office radio station. This made it possible to maintain a 24-hour watch on any particularly interesting enemy station. Dud Charman, one of the early voluntary interceptors, 
was the inventive genius responsible for much of the new equipment designed for the station. Having got the technical problems more or less sorted out, it was necessary to find a man to be in overall charge. It wasn't an easy job because everyone connected with the Enterprise was learning all the time. The task fell to Colonel Ted Maltby. One of the first things he had to do was to recruit staff and he knew where to get them. He'd already had experience of the work of the voluntary interceptors and he had an immense respect for them. First of all, they provided a tremendous pool from which we could recruit full-time operators uh, who came to us, oh, more than three parts trained intercept operators by nature of their amateur expertise in handling receivers and digging out difficult signals. The question was uh, whether these voluntary interceptors could be organised and accept sufficient discipline to do this job. Well, we needn't have worried. Uh, we got out uh, a whole statement of what was wanted and the organisation and the regional officers called meetings and explained it and the extent of the discipline that those voluntary interceptors imposed on themselves was quite extraordinary. I don't think anything but death or, at any rate, unconsciousness uh, would make them miss a schedule. So many of the able-bodied VIs soon found themselves in the uniform of the Royal Signals at Hanslope Park and other stations. But some other VIs were being called up in the ordinary course of events. RSS was determined not to lose them, and special instructions went out. They were put to the test by George Edwards. They changed the call-up age from 30 to 35, and that brought me in within the call-up range. So I informed my area controller, and he gave me a telephone number and told me that when I got my call-up papers, I was to uh, ask the chap who interviewed me to phone this, uh, uh, this number. Well, eventually I got to the, the I went to Amersham for the call up and I saw this chap and I, I, I told him uh, about the uh, telephone number. He said, well, don't mess about. We've, we've had people like you before. He said, what do you want to join? The Army, Navy, the Air Force? I said, well, I'm not allowed to join anything. I said, all, I'm, all you've got to do is to phone this telephone number. So after a, a bit of uh, humming and hiring, he did telephone the number. And he came back looking rather crushed and said, he said, you're right, you know, you're nothing to do with us. You just go away and wait till somebody sends for you. Well, radio security services soon sent for George Edwards. They had a special job for him. Having found mystery signals, it was necessary to find out where they were coming from. And so, just as in the First World War, direction finding stations were set up in various parts of the country. There were about eight of them and a typical station was the one at Wyndham, near Norwich. It was a large metal tank, originally sunk to its top in the ground. The tank itself was recently found in a nearby farmer's field. George Edwards, call sign G2UX, and Jerry Openshaw, call sign E2820, spent a great deal of the war inside it. Radar was the in thing in those days, and the locals referred to the tank as the radar station. This suited the security services very well and they said nothing to scotch the rumour. Well, it's 35 years since uh, I came down that ladder into this room and uh, where we're standing now was the radio direction finding equipment. Still all the things that we recognise are here, even the hooks that we put our uh, headphones on, these are still the headphones that I used at the station when the uh, work came up from uh, London, it came in the form of uh, Morse signals, CQ, CQ, the RSS, uh, with uh, the call sign of the station required, and then a frequency in kilocycles. And uh, immediately after that, there was the uh, signals from the station, which were put onto the landline, and uh, these were heard in one earphone, which you had connected to the landline. The other earphone was connected to the radio set and you tuned in on the radio set until you matched the two signals across uh, from one headphone to the other and then immediately you start taking radio direction finding bearings. If you were lucky you could get a, a direction finding bearing within perhaps 
three or four seconds of getting the instruction from London and you were able then to tell uh, which direction the station was transmitting from. So what had we now? A large and expensive setup with ramifications all over the country covered by a security blanket which covers it yet. At the beginning of the war, listening at home, the VIs had stumbled on the mystery signals which had caused so much excitement among the intelligence boys. But who were they listening to? Who was putting out the signals they were copying so carefully? Nobody told them. To this day, they don't know. And now I'm going to tell them. They were listening to the secret messages of the German intelligence services. The Abwehr, the Gestapo and the Sicherheitsdienst of Himmler's infamous SS. By late 1941, the British secret intelligence services were getting an almost complete set of messages from the secret services of the enemy. They knew where the enemy's stations were located. They even knew the names of the enemy operator's girlfriends. Experts found that by analysing the preambles to the messages, it was possible to arrange the stations into some 13 distinct groups. And there was another which tended to use foul language, chatting between the operators. Uh, this was nicknamed the Bum Boys. One of the groups dealt with agents in foreign seaports who were spying on Allied shipping. The biggest group, with ramifications all over occupied Europe, was the Gestapo. They had a vast network of stations and were always changing their operating times and behaviour. So the VIs were particularly useful in keeping headquarters in touch with those stations. Group 3 used to send trainee spies into a semi-hostile area of North Africa, from where they could pull them out if they got into trouble. A group known as the Violet Group operated in the Balkans from a blind school in Bucharest and went around as blind men. As well as the Germans, the VIs listened to other Axis powers, as Dud Charman recalls. Now another group I remember was the Italian group, Group 8. Uh, they were looking after the shipping running across to feed Rommel's armies in North Africa. And uh, they were a very busy group. And of course they were proper Italians. We could recognize them straight away because every nationality has its own Morse fist. Uh, you could distinguish an Englishman from a German by just listening to his Morse sending. And when an Italian sends Morse, you can hear his shirt tail flying in the breeze. All this material was on the ultra-secret list, and it was analysed by a brilliant group of intelligence officers, many of them university dons. One of the younger members of that concentration of brain power was Hugh Trevor Roper, now Regis Professor of Modern History at Oxford. The material that we got was of great practical value. Uh, a lot of it, of course, was sent on the, uh, de was enciphered on the Enigma machine, which the Germans thought was totally uh, undecipherable, and uh, therefore they were pretty open in what they said uh, in these messages. And through them, we obtained a really very complete knowledge, both of the structure and of the daily working of the whole German secret service. This knowledge was valuable in itself and could be applied in many ways. Uh, for instance, it enabled us to capture every spy who arrived in England uh, as soon as he uh, landed. It was uh, of great value in deception. Deception consisted of feeding false information in to the German general staff through the German secret service. And in order to know exactly uh, what diet to give them and how to season it and in what doses to give it and through what channels to give it, one needed to understand intimately the animal that one was feeding. And uh, this, I think, was one of the most important functions uh, which this material played. I could give two instances, uh, two, I think, spectacular instances. Uh, one was the famous Operation Mincemeat, uh, when a corpse was floated ashore at Malaga uh, with secret documents uh, which deceived the Germans effectively into thinking that we were going to land in Greece, not in Sicily, in 1943. That was a great success story and is widely known in, uh, publicly. That simply wouldn't have been possible 
uh, if it hadn't been for this material, which first showed us where we could land the corpse so that the Spaniards would pick it up and hand, it over to, uh, the, hand the papers over to the Germans. And even after that, uh, we were able to follow through this material the transmission of the documents and the extent to which they were believed through the whole German uh, general staff machinery. Uh, that is one operation which simply couldn't have been done without the added sensitivity which was given to us by a continuous knowledge of the operation of the German Secret Service. Another, of course, was the great build-up of false information uh, by which we persuaded the Germans in the summer of 1944 that the main landing in Europe was not going to be in Normandy but in the Pas de Calais. Of course, that deception operation was not uh, carried out entirely by feeding messages through spies to the German secret service. That was only part of it. It was also by an enormous uh, multiple build-up in every way. But it, again, it wouldn't have been possible unless we'd known exactly how this animal breathed, fed, what it, uh, what it would take, what it wouldn't take, how much, which agents it trusted, which it didn't, etc. I'll leave the experts to work out the full implications of Professor Trevor Roper's words, but a few moments' thought would indicate that they are considerable. Chapters in several books on espionage will have to be rewritten. For example, the case of the Cicero affair, usually represented as a German triumph, might need a rethink. Cicero photographed uh, secret documents uh, in the embassy uh, and sold them to the Germans. And we knew all about this, uh, and uh, we uh, saw the material, our material, our secret documents, uh, being sent to Germany from the German Secret Service in, uh, in Ankara. But we were hamstrung because we couldn't communicate this fact to the ambassador by the ordinary uh, uh, telegrams, because it was precisely these telegrams which Cicero was photographing and sending to Germany. And therefore, uh, if we uh, indicated uh, that we knew about Cicero at all, uh, the Germans would realize that we were reading the messages. And uh, uh, so the whole Cicero affair had to be done by sending people out personally uh, in order to convey personal messages because we simply couldn't afford to, uh, to mention it in, uh, the, uh, in any communication that we sent out. It wasn't that the Germans were deciphering our uh, uh, traffic. We weren't frightened about that. Uh, we were pretty sure they weren't. Uh, it was that uh, w when they were deciphered at the other end and were in the ambassador's safe, the ambassador's valet was uh, uh, unlocking them uh, and photographing them and sending them to Germany. We've come to the end of our story. It's now for others to evaluate the significance of some of the facts we've presented, and I've no doubt they will. The contribution made to the war effort by the government code and cipher school at Bletchley Park has already been acknowledged. But Radio Security Services, with its bunch of professionals and host of amateurs, supplied the raw material. And how good that material was, you've heard tonight. Interpreted by some of the best brains in Britain, it enabled our intelligence to play a cat-and-mouse game with the enemy. Very little the Nazis did, it seems, was unknown to us. Tonight, at last, those voluntary interceptors know what they were doing in the Second World War. They were winning it.